You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners out there in listener land. This is episode 143 of the Common Descent Podcast, a podcast about evolution, life history, paleontology, and so on. This episode, we're talking about monitor lizards. Monitor lizards. A very cool group of lizards, and appropriate for this month since it is snake month, and monitors are pretty close cousins of snakes. Yeah, they're lizardy in there. They're in there. And a very cool group of lizards. This episode, once we get into the main discussion, we will talk about what monitor lizards are, what makes them special, how they live their lives, what's going on with their bodies, and (laughs) what we know about their evolution and fossil record, including some of the famous ancient monitor lizards. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. This is a very, this is probably my favorite group, like, of lizards. This is... Yeah, it's a a good choice. And we haven't done a lot of lizard episodes on this podcast. Very true. So we'll get into that in a little bit. The other reason we're doing this, of course, is because we get requests from our listeners. This episode topic comes to us thanks to requests from Jonathan, Johan, another Jonathan, Matthew, Big Boss Man, and Lizzie. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, Appropriate last name there for this episode. Right? Yeah, it worked (laughs) out pretty well. So thank you to the requesters. We hope you enjoy it. Before we get into the main meat of the episode... A bunch of announcements. Announcement number one, we have a Patreon. Mm -hmm. On our Patreon, patrons get all sorts of goodies in exchange for helping to financially support our science education efforts through this podcast. One of the rewards that patrons can get is a shout out, their name shouted out in gratitude here on the podcast. This past month, we have received a lot of new patrons. Yeah, we have. And we are very grateful because they're joining for Croc and Snake Month stuff, which we'll mention here in a second. But first, some shout-outs to our new patrons. Sung Yoon, Vallis, Samuel, Niccolo and Violet, Kristoff, Hugyuf, and Mark. Wow, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, for expanding our list of patrons, and for helping to support the podcast and the things that we do. We really appreciate it. It's That's incredible. And we especially appreciate it these days because it is now July, which means that it is Snake Month! Snake Month. Last month, June, was Croc Month, our first ever Croc Month for the podcast. This is now Snake Month. Both months are dedicated to us celebrating our favorite groups of animals. We've got snake-themed content that's going to be moving its way into our episodes and projects all throughout the month. We're going to have special posts going up on social media all throughout the month. We've got a special snake stuff channel on Discord for talking about snakes. And later this month, we are going to have a bonus episode with a special guest talking about snake conservation. Same basic stuff we did for Croc Month, so if you missed the Croc Month stuff, go check it out. If you're excited for the Snake Month stuff, stay tuned. And the other new exciting thing we're doing for Snake Month is that we have a new tier on our Patreon. In addition to our normal subscription levels, there is currently a Snakes and Crocs tier. Last month it was the Crocs and Snakes tier. It's the same tier, we just changed the name for flavor. (laughs) Patrons who subscribe at this tier not only get a bunch of goodies as usual, but the donations we receive at this tier during June and July will contribute to charitable donations we will be making at the end of the summer towards snake and croc conservation efforts. So if you want to support us and also support the protection of reptiles around the world, this is a great way to do both at the same time. We hope that you will consider joining us on Patreon like all those people who just got their names shouted out a minute ago. Links to all those ways that you can interact with us are in the episode description. Also in the episode description is our physical mailing address. Yup. We got a card recently. To celebrate Croc Month yeah. from Elizabeth. Yeah, we did. We got an alligator postcard with a very <laughs> cute picture of an alligator that will very likely be going up on my wall next to other <laughs> gator and croc pictures and postcards I have. So thank you very much for that. Hey, also speaking of bonus content, last month in June, we did two Silver Screen Science episodes about the documentary series Prehistoric Planet and the blockbuster phenomenon Jurassic <laughs> World Dominion. <laughs> the blockbuster thing Thing that that happened that that was a movie you can listen to what we had to say about the science and our silver screen science and if you're on patreon you can listen to our additional thoughts our more thoughts episode just for patrons we got a lot going on this time of the year well yeah it's busy 
One more announcement before we move on. This one, a little bit more of a solemn one. Mm -hmm. Here in our country of the United States, there has recently been some major legal action intended to make it much more difficult for people around our country to gain access to abortion and related health care, which has understandably made a lot of people in this country very upset, including us. We here at the podcast think that this decision is medically and morally wrong and also dangerous and a real shame. So... We're doing something about it. We've made a couple of donations. Yes, we have. First, to the National Network of Abortion Funds, which provides financial assistance and other support to people seeking abortions. And second, to an organization called Answer, which provides sex education for young people and adults, because uh, that's very on brand for us, believing that education is a great short-term and long-term way to address issues such as these. Yeah, trying to address the current issue, but also the larger subject. Yes. If you'd like to learn more about these organizations to which we are donating, you can find links again down in the episode description. We have donated $300 to each of those organizations. We know that a lot of people, including a lot of our scientist colleagues, a lot of our listeners, and people all over the country are frustrated and frightened by these legal changes. So if you're interested in finding out what kind of things are being done to help protect people and hopefully make things better for the future, you can follow those links and find out more. There are organizations doing good work. Yes, yes, there are. So we're, we're trying to support those that are trying to help. Yeah, trying to do our part on top of our general science education efforts. Yes. And speaking of our general science education efforts, let us continue into our first main section, the news. News. Every episode, we take some time to pick some news items, new research from around the science world, paleontology, evolution, and the like, and share it with you, our listeners, and also each other. This is a great way for everybody to keep up to date on what news is happening, because otherwise we will miss a lot of stuff. Yup. Will, what news do you have to start us off today? Well, since we've been focusing these months on cool animals, I thought this month was appropriate to do a news about a very cool group of animals. Snakes? Uh, squids. Uh, yeah, so cephalopods are pretty awesome. They are pretty awesome. They do have very snaky appendages. This is some news about a fossil vampire squid. Uh, not a new specimen, but a new analysis of a very well-preserved fossil vampire squid oh. cousin fangs and everything all right right yeah the cloak <laughs> uh yeah for anyone who doesn't know the vampire squid is a deep sea dwelling cousin of the octopus it's got fins like a squid but it's not a squid uh and they just kind of float there and catch little bits of food in the water column but they look they have this cloak like webbing in their arms which gives them the name vampire squid along with their what look like barbs, but they're not actually barbs on their tentacles. Right. Also, famously, they can't enter buildings unless they're invited in. Yeah, no. Uh, also, because it, there's no doors down there, so it makes right. it very difficult. Right. That's actually an ancestral trait among <laughs> cephalopods, is not having doors. <laughs> this is research by Allison Rowe et al. in Scientific Reports, and the article is by Nicoletta Lanis in Live Science. Hey, that article will be linked uh, with all the news articles in the blog post. Sure, well, so this fossil is a very well-preserved specimen, uh, which is always exciting with cephalopods because they are mostly soft tissue, so we don't typically get very good fossils of them. This is a 3D-preserved fossil from a Jurassic fossil site in France that is well-known for this kind of preservation, where the flesh is replaced by iron-rich minerals and preserves many specimens actually in 3D. This is Vampironasa rodansia, which seems to be likely the oldest relative to today's vampire squid, which is Vampirotuthus infernalis, which is a cool name. It's a very cool name. And from the 3D fossil, they can tell you know a few things about it. It's got eight arms. It's got the suckers on the inside of the arms preserved, the spiky appendages on the arms that we also see in today's vampire squid. These are called Siri. And that's C-I-R-R-I, right. not Siri. Yeah. Ca catch that fish for me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> they also saw that the tentacles had one single row of suckers down the arm. Gotcha. As opposed to the paired suckers along the arms of octopuses. Exactly. Now, this was first examined in 2002, but they had some difficulty actually analyzing in detail the anatomy of the animal because it was in 3D. They couldn't see inside it. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, that actually made it difficult initially to get a good idea of what its anatomy and internal structures were like and how it might have been living because they were blocked by the animal. This study used synchrotron X-ray microtomography on three specimens to reconstruct that internal structure. Basically, get an X-ray of it. They said that they were effectively able to digitally dissect it. Oh, yeah, cool. And get a really good look at its internal anatomy. Yeah, I guess it's a CT scan. Uh, tomography is more accurate than my X-ray comparison. Yeah, yep. And they found some cool features, uh, some of which are shared with today's vampire squid, supporting that it is indeed a close relative of our today's, or at least, you know, distant ancestor, but definitely related one thing they were able to note is that the unique style of sucker attachment that we see in this group was present, which means that that goes back to the Jurassic in this group. Cool. Uh, it's a notable feature of vampirids. They really zoomed in on the suckers. That was where a lot of their study focused. And while they are similar in shape to today's vampire squid, they were notably larger and more numerous, spaced closer together on the arms. It also had a different configuration of suckers and the Siri, the little barbs, on two of its arms, which were slightly longer than the other six, oh. which we do not see in today's Vampire Squid. They all have equal, all yeah, eight yeah. arms are the same size. But we do see that in other, in Squid Squid, mm -hmm. where they'll often have those two extra long arms. Yeah. And so that indicates that they were likely a more predatory yeah. feeding strategy. While today's vampire squid is a, not a, sedentary isn't quite the right word, but right. they just float. Yeah. They just hang in the water and they use long filaments that are sticky to grab bits of food, marine snow mostly, and mm -hmm. little animals, and pull it in. So they're not actively grabbing food. This looks like the body of a active predator. It also has a more narrow and muscular body, mm -hmm. the actual body of the animal. So it looks like it was probably an open water pursuit predator, or at least moving from food to food and capturing it, which makes this specimen consistent with the hypothesis that this group had diversified on continental shelf environments mm -hmm. prior to the deep sea adaptations that we see show up in around the Oligocene. Ah, so closer to the continents, shallower waters, and then later some of them moved into the deep. Yes, that has been that was the standing hypothesis, and this seems to fit that model. Okay. That the older specimen was more active, was not a deep sea specialist. I think it's so cool that when you want to learn about the feeding behaviors of different animals, the part of the body that you need to look at varies wildly. Oh, yeah. That that those suckers, those arms, that anatomy is the main way that these animals are interacting with their ecosystem. So having an opportunity to look at them in extreme detail tells us a ton about their lifestyle. Absolutely. It's, it's very particular group to group what kind of suckers and arm arrangements you see and... Yeah, it matches very closely to what they're doing with them. Yep. Well, hey, if our listeners want to learn more about those topics, we did cephalopods way back in episode 16, and the deep sea back in episode 128. My next bit of news relates to episode 101, which was sauropods, oh. and episode 92, which was eggs. Hey! And episode 84, which was paleopathology. Well, now Which I'm is... nervous. <laughs> <laughs> this is a study of a malformed sauropod egg. Oh. So sauropods, we talk about them all the time. The big long-necked, long-tailed, column-legged dinosaurs from back in the Mesozoic. One of the later and largest groups of sauropods were the titanosaurs. This study examined a titanosaur nest from the late Cretaceous Lamenta Formation of India. So these are, this is dinosaur eggs from around 68 million years ago. One egg in particular is wrong. <laughs> this research is by Harsha Diman et al. in the journal Scientific Reports, and we will link in the blog post to a press release by Enrico De Lazaro in Sci News. Here's what's wrong with the egg. So the egg itself is about 16 centimeters across, or about 6 inches. 
and they got a good internal view of it, the way that it was fossilized, which showed them that there was the normal eggshell, you know, right where you expect it to be, around the outside of the egg, and then inside of that, a second eggshell. That's that's one too many eggshells. Egg within an egg. <laughs> now, today, among reptiles and their cousins, this can ten- tends to happen two ways, according to the author's description. One is what's called a multi-shelled egg, where you have basically the, the eggshell layer forms twice. All right. So two closely spaced eggshell layers, a double layer of egg. So it's like it's like when you copy paste and you accidentally hit V twice and you paste. Right. <laughs> <laughs> This arrangement, and it, this is pathological, it's not supposed to form that way. Eggs don't do not do well with double the eggshell. No, <laughs> like, you, the egg's a great structure for protecting and breathing and, you know, waste handling, but doubling up that layer... <laughs> yeah, no, that's not what you want. It's meant to be in contact with the air and the embryo, not another shell. Right. <laughs> this multi-shelled structure is reported in plenty of reptiles and also in birds... But the other way this can happen is a condition called ovum in ovo, (laughs) egg in an egg, which is very similar, two layers, but there is a gap between the two layers with space for a yolk in between. Oh, like literally an egg formed inside. Literally an egg inside an egg. Another egg that was fully fully set. (laughs) So it's an egg with a yolk and everything, but there's also another egg inside of that egg. Whoa, that's way too (laughs) cramped. That version of this deformity has only been observed in birds. Hmm. This research is the first time that something like that has been observed in ancient dinosaurs. Now, it is not at all surprising that dinosaurs would have something similar to what we see in birds today. In fact, that's what we expect. But it hasn't been clear up until, I mean, still to now, how similar dinosaur reproductive tracts were to modern birds. So their two closest groups of relatives today to ancient dinosaurs, birds, which are dinosaurs, and crocs, which are very close, both have a setup of the uterus where there are two different regions, Mm -hmm. one of which produces the shell membrane of an egg, and the other region produces the hard calcium outer layer. Oh, it's an assembly line. Yes, basically. Whereas most reptiles don't have specialized regions like that. That's something crocs and birds both share, and we might expect to see that same thing across all dinosaurs. But one of the big differences between croc reproduction and birds is that crocs tend to lay their eggs simultaneously. They lay Uh... one clutch basically all at the same time. Yes, they do. Whereas birds have a habit of laying eggs sequentially. They lay eggs one at a time. Oh, you're right. I'd never, I'd never thought of that comparison. Yep. So think of chi- anyone who raises chickens. This is how chickens do it. Yeah. Is they'll lay their eggs one at a time. It is a sequential laying strategy that is the result of their particular specializations in the uterus and the reproductive system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because like I've I've seen that with songbirds. You know, they'll make a nest on a porch. Mm-hmm. And you'll see inside, and it's like, oh, there's an egg. And then you'll come back the next day, and there's two eggs. And yep. then there's three eggs. Like, I just had never thought about the fact that they were doing it in steps. Yeah, uh, crocs and gators and cousins, they have they go into a trance and just... just lay eggs. Dunk, 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 dunk in the entire clutch in the nest. Which is how most egg-laying animals do it. Yes. Uh, that's how rep- across reptiles, amphibians, and so on, birds are unique. Oh, so the fact that so the presence of this pathology in a sauropod dinosaur, that is a type of egg mess up that we only see in birds might be an indication that a lot of other dinosaurs had reproductive systems more like birds than like what we see in crocs and other reptiles. Now, whether or not that tells us that they were laying eggs sequentially like birds were, that's hard to say for sure. Yeah. But it raises the possibility that ancient dinosaurs, at least big sauropods, probably other theropods, if sauropods are doing it, might have been producing and maybe even laying eggs similarly to modern birds, which could lead them to suffering from similar accidents, right, deformities in egg laying. That's so awesome. Yeah, it's tons of fun when, like, 
whenever we, we talked about paleopathologies with Laura in episode 84, when you get a sign of injury or deformity or something gone wrong with the body in the, in the fossil record, it's always super cool because you get to go, oh, cool, that's not what that's supposed to look like. Yep. But it is always informative. Oh, yes. It always tells you something interesting about the life of that organism. Well, because there are certain injuries, diseases, conditions that are unique to groups. Like, not every group gets this kind of arthritis or this kind of deformity or whatever yeah. it is. Or this injury or disease will only happen under certain circumstances. Yeah. It also, my brain is just reeling through every dino documentary I've ever seen showing an egg laying event. Like mm-hmm. walking with dinosaurs had that with the, the sauropods with their long ovipositor yep. <laughs> depositing egg after egg. No, well, now I'm picturing them laying an egg and then walking away. Okay, going off to get lunch. Yeah. And, and then, then coming back. <laughs> later that afternoon or the next day, laying the next egg. Mm-hmm. Which, like, that well, would have massive implications for their nesting behaviors. Yeah. Because you have to keep a nest and keep returning to it. Yeah. You can't just kunk, 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 bury it and go. Mm-hmm. You, you might be there for three or four days, depending on what your sequence is like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, at, like I said, this is not definite evidence towards really anything in particular but gets the wheels turning about what ways uh, extinct dinosaurs might have had bird-like reproductive habits yeah it's pretty cool now i just want to know everything about how birds lay eggs (laughs) all right listen we've done a birds episode 37 we've done an eggs episode 92 bird eggs Uh, coming soon uh, pineapple apple pin uh (laughs) I don't understand that. <laughs> Someone out there did. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, my next bit of news, uh, sticking with the theme of uh, awesome topics, but also backing into awesome groups. Is it uh, the same awesome group? Yeah, Sepulpods. Yeah, I, I figured. <laughs> I saw the news list. Uh, this one's about octopus genomes. Okay. Uh, modern genetics on a couple of octop- octopus species that seem to share features with our genome. Huh. Yeah. Did they steal them? (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't put it past them. (laughs) This is research by Giuseppe Petrosino et al. in BMC Biology, and the article is by Donovan Coffey in Live Science. This research was looking at octopus genomes, but specifically it was looking at transposable elements uh jumping genes jumping genes so jumping genes are sections of dna that are able to copy themselves and move around the genome that they, they jump around your genome they move their place this came up in a recent news that i will remember before the end of this news yes, discussion there you go. Per- perhaps <laughs> They're very notable and uh, of significant interest to us because they make up about 45% of our genome. Mm -hmm. Like, they're very important in the human genetic structure. It came up in a recent news about snake venom evolution. There you go, yes. That's what it was. That might have been last episode. It was very recent. Yep, yep. In us humans, it has been noted and thought potentially strongly connected with our nervous system. Specifically, one group of transposons, transposable genes, called the long interspersed nuclear elements, or line genes, which seem to be tightly regulated by our brain and play a role, it seems, in learning and memory formation in our hippocampus. Okay. So, like, these seem to be very important genes to the functioning of our higher learning and higher thinking in our brain. All right. Hippocampus, uh, episode 121 for brains. Yep, yep. And episode 136 for seahorses. (laughs) (laughs) Now, here's where the octopus comes in. The octopuses come in. Among invertebrates, they are notable for being by far the most problem-solving and cognitive, you know, highly intelligent, as they are often described. By our standards. By our standards. Among invertebrates, there's nothing else that compares to them. So they wanted to look at their genome and see... What does their smart genome look like? <laughs> they sequenced the genome of two species. Uh, I think one species in this study, and there was another study. In this study, it was octopus bimaculoides, and another study, I think, a recent study did octopus vulgaris. In this research, they revealed a major expansion of jumping genes 
in these octopus genomes. Specifically, they also found genes from the line family. Hmm. So they found similar genes or same ones. I wasn't sure how similar based off the, the abstract, but that they found line jumping genes just like the ones we have in these two octopus. Wow. So the same basically part of genome and type of genes yes. doing a similar function. And they found it in the vin- the vertical lobe, which is the section of their brain that is mainly uh, responsible for their critical thinking and learning. Ah. So a similar section of the body as well where they were active. They even said that it's functionally analogous to our hippocampus. Whoa. So like they seem to be having similar genetic activity of jumping genes in a similar part of their brain. Cool. So they have, uh, it seems, evolved a similar genetic strategy to accomplish the same sort of braininess that we have accomplished in our evolution. Yeah, it seems that there might be a legitimate connection to these jumping genes and cognitive ability, Mm -hmm. problem solving and, and learning ability. You know, this is further support that there is a connection between these genes and brain function. And it does seem to be evidence that we and octopuses have convergently evolved to this kind of function, this kind of setup. Cool. Either that or it's something that is shared by our ancestor going back however very, 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 very far. And we've both purposed that type of gene the same way yes either way a convergent arrival at a similar process a similar genetic development that's very cool very cool because it tells us a bit about the evolution of for lack of a better word braininess yes smartness smartness but also always exciting to find ways that we are like octopuses right it it's (laughs) just another notch on the belt of they would be the next civilization (laughs) right well, and also octopuses have been around longer than we have. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how far back that feature in us goes. Like, is that across apes? Is it across primates? Uh, unless it goes really far back, there's a good chance octopuses did it first. Very likely. So, yeah. Or, as I mentioned, they stole it from us. Yep. Like the Zerg. I'd love to see this done on other cephalopods. Yes. Because not all cephalopods show the same level of problem solving that octopuses do. Right. Like squids, squids are, you know, there are many that are notable for complicated behavior, but they aren't typically showing the same like opening bottles. They're not outsmarting their keepers. Yes, exactly. Well, it makes me want to see the same sort of investigation done on birds, especially things like parrots and crows, which are famed for this. Yep, yep. To a bit of a foreshadowing for later in the episode, it'd be cool to see this done on monitor lizards. It would be really, really cool. Which are also renowned for being brainy lizards. Yep, yep. Very cool. Well, I too have a news about DNA in modern animals, but this time I'm being topical. This news is about snakes. I was very tempted to go, modern animal butts. Uh, <laughs> modern animal butts no not animal butts snakes we're talking about a snake dna <laughs> specifically dna uh, recovery from snakes teaching us cool stuff but also an investigation into the methods of recovering dna this is research by justin bernstein and sarah ruain in frontiers in ecology and evolution and we will link to a press release in fizz.org from the field museum This research collects snake DNA, not from fossils, but from preserved museum specimens. Oh, neat. So this is pretty common. Museums will have preserved just bodies of animals or tissues and such in collections. These are often very important because a lot of the time these can be the only available specimens of a lot of species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've got a species of frog or bird or snake or whatever it is that is very rare or hard to find... Or just difficult to acquire for any sort of reason, old museum specimens that have just been around for a while can be the only access you can get to study the tissues and such of these animals. Yeah. But museum preservation is not always good for DNA, especially older specimens. 
not only because they've been around longer, but also because if you go back far enough, no one knew we had to preserve them for that. Yes, yeah, that, <laughs> that wasn't something we knew was going to be required. <laughs> right. And if you go back far enough, it wasn't something that we knew existed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... <laughs> like, either way, it would just wasn't on the radar yep this study looked at specimens that are stored at the field museum in chicago in what the press release describes as a secret bunker (laughs) with biological specimens in a collection of fish lizards snakes all sorts of stuff that many of which are decades to centuries old Wow. But they have been here for quite some time. I'm picturing all the doors opening to MST3K. <laughs> it's just <laughs> heading down the bunker. I was thinking of the warehouse in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> These specimens are preserved in alcohol uh, with formalin, which is done specifically to help keep the bodies nice and intact, but also is bad for DNA. Yeah, because yep. it creates cross-linking among DNA, which essentially means the DNA strands get all tangled up in knots. Nevertheless, this research attempted to extract DNA from about 150 snake specimens in this collection. The snakes that they were looking at are homolopsid snakes, or mud snakes. These are snakes that live in South-Southeast Asia, Australia, uh, New Guinea, and I believe a bunch of other places in that part of the world. And unsurprisingly, a lot of these specimens did not give good genetic results, which did not get a lot of DNA remains. And the authors make a point in the discussion to say that oftentimes what will happen is we'll just set those aside and just say, yep, these didn't work. Let's move on. But here they wanted to focus in a little bit more on what didn't work and are there ways to get around it? Yeah, because bad results when looking for DNA and specimens like these are way more common than good results. Yes. But the good results are the ones that we often talk about in the studies. So instead of just, you know, tossing the results out, they describe some of the new methods they tried to improve the recovery of DNA. Uh, I'll mention these briefly. I'm not going to go into detail because this is outside of my scope. <laughs> often to get DNA, specimens will be treated with special enzymes and then heated Here, as they described, they tried more enzymes and more heat. (laughs) And when there was still lots of gaps and fragmentation among the DNA, they tried a different software than they usually would to try to visualize and identify the errors and the missing bits in the DNA to help put it back together. I know that they're doing very careful, very delicate work, but I'm just picturing the, the giant Frankenstein ma- the, the machine with yeah, just steam coming out of more it. More switches, <laughs> just more power, more heat, <laughs> faster, add more enzymes. <laughs> but yes, I'm sure this was like very scientifically done, <laughs> but boiled down to yeah, it did more of the stuff. Yeah. In the end, using these new methods, and if any of you out there are uh, ancient DNA researchers and you want to learn more about these methods, I can't tell you about it, but you can read the paper. Yes. Uh, The link in the uh, the blog post and in the press release, there's a link to the paper. In the end, this approach was able to give them pretty decent DNA samples from a handful of specimens, so nowhere near all of them, but they did manage to recover some better DNA than they otherwise would have, sort of cobbled together using their particular methods. The reason that they go into all of this detail, and they make this point in the press release, is that the authors were really interested in being very transparent about the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discussing not only the specimens where it worked, but what failed and what didn't work, and then beyond that, how they got around it. What type of attempts to fixing it worked, Uh, They use the word finagling, (laughs) what finagling they needed to do to get more usable results, which isn't something that papers like this often do, it seems like. Oftentimes it's, yeah, these didn't work maybe for these reasons. Now let's talk about what we did find. Yes, let's focus on the positive results. Here they focused a bit more on the failures that they came across, which is really good. Well, I really appreciate that because it has the same energy as a lot of like uh, hobby forums where, you know, people making a prop or making a thing and they're all making relatively the same thing. And so they're discussing like, hey, I've been having trouble with this. Has anyone else figured out a way around that? And they can say, yeah, here's what I did. Here's what I did. And by conversation and group Mm -hmm. cooperation, they come down to techniques that neither 
one of the people involved would come to all by themselves. Right. So I like this approach. That's a very, especially for a technique, you know, Mm -hmm. or trying to access DNA. And they did get some positive results from it. Nice. So all the snakes they looked at were mud snakes, except for a couple specimens from one species that it hasn't been sure if it's a mud snake or not. This species is Hydrablabes periops, the olive small-eyed snakes of Borneo. Very few specimens are known, and there has been debate as to whether or not they fit in the mud snakes, Homolopsidae, or Natricidae, which is the group that includes water snakes and garter snakes and such. Oh, okay. Here, because they were able to use these museum specimens that have been preserved for a long time, and because they were able to get some usable DNA using these methods, they were able to genetically compare it and determine that it is, in fact, not a mud snake, that it is a natricid, natricid uh, closer to garter snakes and water snakes and stuff. Cool. So they've got, they're underscoring the importance of museum collections and specimens, ways that we can get around some of the difficulties with recovering ancient DNA from these specimens, and showing that while talking about the failures and the struggles, they also got some positive new results, uh, which is probably a really good way to do it because uh, many scientists, I'm sure, will tell you that it is very hard to publish negative or failed results. Yeah. Like, that's just harder to get published than cool, positive new things. Yeah, because... Like, we tried all these methods and none of them worked. Yeah. That's valuable information. Absolutely. It just doesn't get published and certainly not publicized nearly as much as positive results. Yeah, because uh, as scientific as publications are very often it there is still an aspect of of newsworthiness and you know popularity a lot of papers want the things that they publish to be things that a lot of people are going to read right which does block the way for very useful information about here's all the things we did and how they seemed to fail Mm -hmm. so that other people can go ooh, we've been using one of those techniques and now we can maybe readjust, realizing that it's more faulty than we thought. Right. You know, like, that's very good information. So I like this of just publishing the full, <laughs> your full experience. Yeah. Here's what we got. <laughs> Here's what we didn't get and how we didn't get it. So this study, not only uh, cool new information about snakes, but is a cool insight into the process. Mm-hmm. What specimens we use, where they're preserved, how they're preserved, how that affects them. And how we can potentially get around some of those issues. Yeah, I'd love to see that more of that in papers, yeah. just in general. Well, that's enough news. It's time for our main discussion. After this short musical break, we will move on to our main subjects for the episode, Monitor Lizards. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. We're going to talk about what makes them cool and what has made them cool for tens of millions of years. Stay tuned. The coolest lizards, the best lizards, of course, are snakes. <laughs> we did a whole episode about them, episode three. The second best group of lizards is mosasaurs, and we did an episode about them, <laughs> episode 51. But the coolest group of lizards that aren't snakes and aren't totally extinct have to be monitors. The, the lizards, uh, of the lizards that still look like lizards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the lizards that are still trying. <laughs> Monitor lizards are an extremely exciting group of modern day, mm-hmm. still around today, lizards. They are widespread across the old world. They go by other names. They're also called goannas. Mm-hmm. And they also have a bunch of names in a variety of languages across Africa, Southeast Asia, the Indonesia, the Philippines, that whole area. Monitors are generally carnivorous. They are very diverse. They are very charismatic. Uh, They're popular in the pet trade. They are often quite large. There are a number of very famous species of monitors. For example, our Australian listeners will probably be very familiar with parentes, which are a monitor down there. Water monitors are very common. Nile monitors are very famous, uh, famous for where they live and also where they're not supposed to live. (laughs) Yep. And then, of course, Komodo monitors, also known as Komodo dragons, (laughs) are part of this group. But... For all of their incredible 
diversity and the how many species there are and how widespread they are, which we'll get into in a second. What's interesting about monitor lizards is that they all basically look the same. Yeah, you can recognize a monitor pretty quick when you see one. They tend to have a very conserved body shape. That is to say, they all have a very similar anatomy. Will, you like describing things. Boy, do I. Describe for us what a monitor lizard looks like. So monitor lizards still look like lizards. They've got the legs out to the side. You know, they've got the long fingers with claw, hooked claws at the tip. So they still look like a lizard. The part that always stands out to me with monitors is their face. Mm -hmm. They first off have a long neck for a lizard. Like most lizards have this little short, like head just in front of the shoulders. And like, yeah, they've got a mafia boss. now. Yeah, exactly. Just, just right up in there. (laughs) These have actually fairly long necks. Like the neck is typically longer than the head, Mm -hmm. which is not the norm with lizards. And then they've got that pointed face. It yeah, that comes sort of down. slanty, pointed snout of theirs. Yeah, the, the tip is not quite sharp, you know, but it comes down to a small snout, a mm-hmm. small tipped snout, and just has this very triangular, almost pyramid-shaped face on this long neck, and then long, long tails. Yeah. Tails are, like, as long as the the rest of the body. Yeah. I I read some numbers and I didn't read these directly, but just comparing numbers that I saw tails and monitors are often between one and two times the length of the rest of the body. Yeah. Yeah. They're very long tails. So it's, they've got these, they're just very long lizards. They're, it looks like a lizard that you've taken from the body front and back and stretched it a bit. Yeah. They look a bit, uh, as I was reading about their anatomy and looking through pictures of the different species, They look a bit like someone tried to mix an iguana with a snake. Yeah, a little bit. They have that sort of baggy, big-legged lizard thing, but they've got the long necks. They move very sinuously sometimes. They have the forked tongue. Yes, they do. Very much like snakes. That long tail, incidentally, is not just for show. I've seen... uh, There are monitors that use it uh, prehensilely. Yeah, tree climbing For tree climbing and stuff. They will also use it for defense. Yeah. I've seen videos of monitors whipping that tail at stuff that bothers them. Well, my favorite thing about when they whip stuff with their tail is that they don't do it the way I think most people would picture. Because when you typically think of it, you think of like winding back and then whipping, you know, one way. But they will like wind back, but then hold their tail in this C curve Mm -hmm. and walk around with it like that as they're like, (laughs) don't come over here because I'm about to whip you. And they'll just... Hold it in tension, and it looks so weird. And then someone will get too close, and they'll just unleash it, and that thin tip just will will whip. Yeah, monitors very cool. Uh, if this hasn't given you an image, Google a picture of a monitor lizard. You might recognize it, or you can check out the blog post where there will be pictures. But like I said, despite having this very common body shape, they are very diverse lizards. Oh yeah. Monitor lizards are spread all across the tropics and subtropics of the Old World. So they're found all over Africa, across South Asia. They're in India. They're in the Middle East. Australia is very famous for having a wide variety of monitors and lots of islands. They're across Indonesia. They're across Philippines. That whole west to southwest Pacific region is full of monitors. Yay. They are also very famously uh, found in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> They're not supposed to be in Florida, <laughs> but monitor, especially Nile monitors, which are native to Africa, hence the name, Nile monitors have established multiple relatively large breeding populations invasively in Florida. Yeah, that's one of those invasive species where, like, I will never encourage invasive species you know protection or 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 you know spreading them or anything like that but like now florida has gators big snakes and monitors like i mean you're kind of yeah you're, you're kind of making it it's it's what this continent has been missing yeah it's like <laughs> there's a little kid part of me that's like i mean that I'm not complaining about the animal you chose to introduce. Right. Just that you introduced a species. Florida is now the only place in the world where you can get alligators and crocodiles and pythons and rattlesnakes (laughs) and monitor lizards. And I mean, that's that's terrible, but 
<laughs> I, I could be worse. Silver lining. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> All monitors today belong to the family Varinidae, and indeed... All living monitors are in the same genus, Varanus. They weren't always considered that way, that it's been shifted over time. Yeah, I don't know that I knew that. But these days, they are all in the same genus, Varanus. How many species there are kind of depends on what paper you're reading. Uh, the most recent numbers that I routinely have seen are at least 70 to 80 species. Okay. That partially depends on what is being counted as subspecies. But when I was going through the literature... I would find resources, references from like 15, 20 years ago that were like, yeah, there's 30 or 40 species. But the recent stuff says 70 or 80 species. They are, they are diverse and we keep learning more about their diversity. Like it wouldn't surprise me if there's another 10 Mm -hmm. uh, in the next several years, just from splitting the ones we know or finding them on an island somewhere where we didn't know that species was there. Yeah. That's what I was going to say was that it makes sense with them occupying so many islands that that happens to us with island groups all the time where it's like we think these three islands have the same species and then we take a closer look and go well no they actually are distinct right the genes or the you know uh, biology or sometimes the behavior is actually notable between them Mm -hmm. uh island chains are are great for messing up taxonomy that way yep so all of these 80 ish species of living monitors same genus Baroness, but about a dozen subgenera. So they are split into different groups. So just for some examples of living monitor diversity, there is the subgenus Odatria, which are sometimes called dwarf monitors. Mm -hmm. These are found in Australia and Indonesia. They include a lot of small-bodied monitors, including a lot of rock-dwelling monitors. Cool. So they live in rocky places, and small bodies are good for going in and out of the crevices, either to escape predators or find prey. Hapturosaurus is the subgenus that is sometimes called tree monitors. Yay! These are arboreal. They are mostly found in the tropical rainforests of Indonesia and New Guinea. That's awesome. These are climbing tree-dwelling monitors. And they're adorable. Samosaurus includes uh, at least a couple of species of desert monitors in Africa and Asia, which live in the deserts. And then one more subgenus that I want to mention... Uh, just specifically is the Papusaurus subgenus, which includes a single species, Varanus salvadorii, the crocodile monitor. Yeah! This is for you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is an arboreal species that lives in New Guinea uh, and is named for crocodiles. A lot of monitors are named for other animals, which yes. is a common thing. <laughs> Lots of other monitors are also semi-aquatic. That's actually a really common thing for monitors to be. Uh, Some are very famous for it. Water monitors, mangrove monitors, of which there are multiple species, the Nile monitors. In fact, in general, monitor lizards tend to be good on land, climbing and swimming. Yeah, they kind of, once again, kind of snake-like in that regard, Mm -hmm. where it's just like, most of you can, can move pretty well. In, in these categories. Yeah. There are specialists. Mm-hmm. There are monitors that spend a lot of time in water. There are some that spend a lot of time in trees. But most monitors, it seems, are pretty good swimmers and pretty good climbers. Even the ones you wouldn't expect to climb are still pretty good at it. And I, I suspect that it is something about that generalized body shape that they all share that just makes them good at all sorts of locomotion. Yeah. Some of them even dig. Yeah, They will dig, uh, I don't know how much burrowing they're doing, but they will substantially make headway into the earth. Yeah, it's it's a, a cool thing when you find a group that's so flexible without having to uber specialize their body types. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have a mole shaped monitor and we don't have a a fish shaped right. monitor. They aren't snake like. Yeah. Like there aren't legless or tiny legged monitors, really. They're doing really well in a variety of habitats across most of the world while still maintaining a pretty similar shape. Yeah. And it's, it, they've kind of got the, the right, you know, body parts. They've got those lizard legs, and lizard legs are good at running and good at climbing. Right. Like, they lots also... of lizards are good at climbing, even if they're not climbing lizards. Yeah. They also, monitors tend to have larger back legs than front legs. Oh, yeah. Uh, which allows at least many of them to also stand up on their back legs. Yep. Like a bear. Just <laughs> up and look around for a bit and then back to your business. They prop up on that tail. <laughs> yep. And it's fantastic. 
But then they've also got that big like croc ish tail. That's mm-hmm. just that's that tail is good for whipping and it's good for balance. But you move it back and forth a bunch in the water, you're gonna go forward. And they swim like crocs. Yes, they do. They put the the legs flat against the body and they just move the tail and the body or uh, back and forth in that sinuous way and they move through the water. Yeah, watching a Nile monitor swim around is like they are extremely mobile. <laughs> They're really good in the water. It's awesome. Monitors also come in a wide range of body sizes. <laughs> the smallest monitors are pygmy monitors of Australia. There are a couple of species I've seen referenced as getting as small as 20 centimeters long. Wow. So less than a foot and weighing about 10 grams. <laughs> and I didn't even write down what that is in ounces. It's very, very small. These monitors are tend to be really good at trees and rocks. They are climby. They are scary scuttling they can go in and out of little crevices and stuff i mean that makes me think of them as like the monitor equivalent of the the fence lizards and mm-hmm. uh, knolls that you find well yeah here the... in uh, in uh, uh north america and florida that size is a very typical lizard size yep it's very small for monitors that's the smallest the small end but most lizards that's a pretty common size to be on the other end of the spectrum there are several species that get to be quite large uh, a number are known to grow over two meters long, mm-hmm. more than six feet, including the crocodile monitors, including water monitors, I believe. Parentes get this big. Nile monitors get this big. Although, if I remember correctly, Nile monitors have a lot of tail. Yeah. Yep. Uh, more so, I think, than a lot of the other big monitors. So we've got several species that are two meters and up. And then, of course, the reigning champions in body size among monitors are Komodo dragons. Yep. Varanus komodoensis is native to a handful of islands in Indonesia, and they get easily over two meters. There are numerous reports of them getting up to three meters, 10 feet long, with weights of 70 to 80 kilograms. So that's 150 to 170 pounds, and the record breakers are bigger than that. Yeah. Komodo dragons are not only the biggest monitors, they are the largest living lizards. Yeah. In fact, they're like 10 times the size of nearly any other lizard in the world today. They are huge. They, they are so big. These are lizards that weigh about as much as your hosts. Yep. Yep. <laughs> not we... together, but individually. Oh, yeah, yeah. We would make two decent sized Komodo dragons. Yeah. <laughs> I am squarely in the weight class. <laughs> Of a Komodo dragon. <laughs> uh, this size range from little 20 centimeter pygmies all the way up to three meter giants, I've seen referred to as easily the largest size range among known vertebrate genera. Because wow. this is one genus. Yeah. Now, comparing one genus to another genus is always a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, it's arbitrary what we call a genus or another genus. So it's not an exact one to one. But of all the things that we scientists have decided to call a single genus, that is a ridiculous size range. Yes, that that is incredible diversity of sizes for a single closely related group of animals. Komodo dragons very famously, uh, they're found on the island of Komodo. They're also found on Flores and a number of other Indonesian islands, but only on islands. Yep. They're also very common in zoos. Yeah. So like, I've seen Komodo dragons in multiple places because they're very common zoo animals. Yep. And they, they are a ton of fun to watch move around. Yeah. Oh, there's just, just, they, they, you don't, you don't normally expect a lizard to plod. Yes. But they plod. That's what I was about to say. You can see the weight in how they walk. Like, yeah. they don't walk like other lizards do where it has kind of a scuttle to it. There is this, each step has a little bit of the Jurassic Park. (laughs) Like it doesn't shake the ground. It doesn't actually make any noise, but you can feel it. You can see that it has weight. This is a big lizard. This is a wolf-sized lizard. Yeah, and it is a robust, beefy. They've got thick limbs, a thick neck, a Mm -hmm. thicker head. Like their head is robust. Big, beefy lizard. In terms of diet, like I mentioned, monitor lizards are generally carnivorous. Across the various species, they eat a wide variety of food. Typically, they're pretty generalist carnivores. They'll eat basically anything. The teeth in monitor lizards, so they have these triangular-shaped teeth. They're very distinctive and very cool-looking. 
They don't look like snake teeth. Snake teeth are very needle-like. A lot of lizards have more complex, varying shapes to their teeth. Monitor lizard teeth tend to be blades, and they tend to be serrated along the back edge. Yep. So serrations, you know, little jagged edges like a steak knife, they tend to be serrated along the back edge. This is unlike something like a shark, where the teeth are serrated on both sides. Yeah, like, uh, shape-wise, they, they are actually kind of similar to a lot of shark teeth. Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of shark teeth that have the same little triangular with a slight curve yes. that monitor lizard teeth have, but they're typically serrated on all edges. Monitor lizards use their back edge serrated teeth for a strategy that I have seen referred to as grip and rip, (laughs) 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 which is they bite and pull back. Yeah. And that's how they get flesh off of whatever they're hunting. Yeah. They don't do the the head side to side motion that a shark does to saw through. Right. Like that's how sharks typically take chunks out of. I have seen some studies of them sort of curving the jaw as they bite of monitor lizards, yeah. I believe, to sort of do a, a, a bit of that slashing Like motion. a one-sided yeah, exactly. instead of a, a front-facing. But a lot of videos you'll watch of them, they just take a bite and then just start yanking yeah, backwards. Back. Like a bird almost. <laughs> yeah, and like just a raptor. pull those teeth through the <laughs> chunk of meat. <laughs> there are some specialists, so for the most part they'll eat whatever, but there are some species that seem to specialize on smaller lizards. Uh, there are some, a lot of semi-aquatic species tend to go for more aquatic prey. Generally, monitors will go for small vertebrates, invertebrates, uh, whatever they can catch. There are at least a few species that are known to eat fruit. Ooh. There are at least, I found re- re- records of at least three frugivorous monitors. Neat. So they're not 100% carnivorous. Not all the time. There are a few that will, will vary, but... For the most part, if you see a monitor, it's a good bet that if you give it a mouse, it will eat that mouse. Yep. Alive or dead. Monitors are famously not only very good at hunting, they're also really good scavengers, especially the big ones. Nice. In fact, while I was scrolling through the literature, I found a 2016 report that detailed the importance of the Asian water monitor. Varanus salvator, which is which lives in China and I think Vietnam, that Southeast Asia area. Cool. This study was specifically going on about the importance of this species of monitor in forensic studies. <laughs> because if you are a forensic scientist in that area, these monitors are common enough scavengers that there's a good chance they will have gotten to the body before you did. <laughs> so this study was about it is important to recognize the signs of what it looks like when a monitor eats carrion because that is what you will potentially see in your forensic analysis. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just homing in with that forked tongue. I dare, dare I find it. Uh, indeed, they have the forked tongue. They use their forked tongue the same way that snakes do. It is a mostly, it's not a fleshy tongue. So lizards occupy a spectrum from very fleshy tongues. So if you have ever if you've ever like fed a bearded dragon yeah. or watched a chameleon eat something, they have very fleshy tongues that are useful for grabbing and manipulating food. Yeah, like our tongue is. Like our tongue. Like very similar. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got like snakes, which have a very dry, hard, thin, relatively weak tongue that isn't be- and sna- snakes are not using their tongue at all for prey. Or for food, it is just for sensing. They wave it through the air, they pick up odors slash tastes, and they deliver that chemical information to the vomeronasal organ, which allows them to chemically sense their environment. Monitor lizards are doing basically the same thing. They're t- 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 As far as I'm aware, they're not using the tongue for food stuff. They swallow things using what is called inertial feeding, <laughs> which means they're letting gravity do the work. Yeah. They throw it back in the, the throat. A bunch of other quick, interesting notes about monitors. Uh, they also have osteoderms. Oh, I don't know that I knew that. So osteoderms are the bones, the armor bones that grow in the skin of a number of animals. So we've talked about them mainly with crocs. Crocs have osteoderms, very big, prominent osteoderms yeah. in their skin on their backs and sides. Armadillos have osteoderms. Uh, we talked about ground sloths in episode 24 having osteoderms. Lots of lizards have osteoderms, glass lizards, skinks, beaded lizards. Monitor lizards also, uh, at least some of them, have osteoderms. 
They've been noted in a number of different species. The most complex and varied osteoderms among monitors were observed in Komodo dragons. Ooh! I found a 2019 study that was describing the surprising amount of different osteoderm shapes in Komodo dragons, specifically in the skull, in the head. Yes. In the skin of the head and face. I did see a thing about this. I, I'm... It was one of the news articles I saw and saved aside to read, and I never did. <laughs> uh, but it had a, a CT scan colored image uh, mm-hmm. of all the little bones in their face and yes. like the neck area. And they described, I think, four different morphologies, four different shapes of their osteoderms. Wow. They might have also noted, and I don't know how if this was true for a particular species or in general, that at least some of the osteoderms might be an adult feature. Oh. That it's something that develops as the animal gets older. Ooh, that's interesting. Uh, but I did not take detailed notes on that, so I don't know the specifics of that inference. But suffice to say that, yeah, varanids, monitor lizards, have osteoderms sometimes. Very cool. They're also noted for their uh, unique breathing style. So most lizards breathe... You, so when we breathe, the whole idea of breathing is you expand your torsal cavity, your body cavity, to ventilate the lungs. Yes. Right, you expand the torso, it draws air in bet- through your mouth and nose, and it fills up your lungs. We do that with a diaphragm, a special organ in our body that our muscles move up and down. Lizards will do that typically using the same muscles they use for walking and moving, which means that lizards oftentimes cannot very efficiently breathe and move at the same time. So uh, most lizards aren't endurance runners, partially for this reason, that the way they have to move to run interferes with the muscles they need to ventilate their lungs. Well, it, it's, it'd be like, uh, it's like when you're trying to catch your breath and talk at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're using your lungs for two things. Yes. <laughs> you're trying to produce sounds, but you're also <laughs> trying to bring air in and out. And you're, you can kind of do it, but it's not good. Monitor lizards use their throat muscles to help ventilate the lungs. They have what's called a guler pump, and that allows them to run and breathe very effectively at the same time, which some have suggested is one of the things that makes them so good at hunting fast-moving prey. Yeah. Is that they can run very efficiently. Yeah, they can actually chase things more like mammals chase things instead of in the short bursts that most lizards run Mm -hmm. and having to catch your breath in between. You can just keep pumping away and chase Yeah, I've seen videos of them taking down, like, rabbits and stuff. Like, things that are not easy to catch. Yeah, not just, like, they can chase some... Like, they can chase prey that is (laughs) good at being chased. (laughs) Yes, that excels at this. It's also a cool idea that they're breathing with their throat, because it always makes me think of them as, like, they function similar to bagpipes, where they've got a secondary (laughs) air sac to move air in and out. Mm-hmm. To pump the lungs instead of just pumping the lungs. Yeah, and I think that when you watch them, you'll often, if you see a video of them, they'll have the throat kind of moving up and down. Yeah. Kind of the way a frog might. And that, I think, is what you're seeing is part of that breathing system. Yeah, well, and they can also swell that for display, uh, I Mm -hmm. believe. Like, I've seen videos of them when they're fighting and their necks are just thick because they're filling the neck up to make them look big and intimidating. Yeah, yeah. Monitor lizards are egg layers, like uh, most other lizards. They'll dig nests, they'll lay batches of eggs, although the reason I bring this up is because another thing that's been noted in at least, I've seen reports of at least five species of monitors, is parthenogenesis. I was wondering how many. I knew I knew it had come up in at least one or two. Yes, Komodo dragons are one. I yep. forget what, I didn't write them down, but I found a couple of reports. Actually, the, the studies that I found talking about this had lovely little lists of what year we discovered each species. <laughs> and it's all been like in the last 15, 20 years yeah. that we've discovered parthenogenesis and monitors. Parthenogenesis is the process by which an animal can reproduce without mating. Yeah, clone Just itself. Create its own fertilized eggs with only its own DNA and create little clones of the parent. We've seen this in a bunch of, like, there are a number of snakes that do this. Mm-hmm. We've seen this in other lizards. We've seen this in a number of fish uh, monitors. I, I I don't know if Komodo dragons are thus 
the largest parthenogenic animals. Oh, yeah. Because I know there are ocean animals. There are fish that do it. Yes. And I think some of the big snakes might do it. Yeah. But they're certainly among the largest known parthenogenic animals. <laughs> Which I've seen uh, attributed to part of their success on islands. That they oh, yeah, can, that makes sense. That a Komodo dragon could conceivably swim to like a volcanic island that's brand new and populate it by herself. Right. Like that female could start a population of Komodo dragons there and that that may be why we see them do so well on these Mm -hmm. isolated islands. And speaking of things that they share with snakes, these days, when you talk about monitor lizards, you also have to talk about venom. Yeah, you do. So there is this long-standing description of Komodo dragons that they bite their prey and then they wait for the prey to die because their mouths are so full of toxic, virulent bacteria that their spit is just so gross that it infects the prey and eventually they die. Yeah, it's just guaranteed blood poisoning. Right. This idea has been challenged in recent years. Partly, I've seen some reports suggest that we don't actually have enough evidence to say that they have particularly worse saliva than other predators. I think not everybody agrees with that. There are still some scientists I've seen cited as supporting this idea but it has at least come under question. Mm -hmm. And the other reason that it has come under question is because there have been a number of studies in the last decade or so that have shown evidence of venom in monitor lizards. So there have been a few famous studies that have demonstrated the presence of proteins in monitor saliva that are very similar to venom proteins that we see in other squamates, notably uh, snakes. There have also been lab tests that have found that this saliva of monitors has anticoagulating effects. Oh. So it it limits blood coagulation, also possibly uh, dropping blood pressure, which are effects we see in a number of venomous animals. The study that I read also pointed out that there are reports, just sort of anecdotal or like short medical reports, of monitor bites on people resulting in extensive bleeding. Yeah. Which also supports this potential anticoagulating effect, all of which seems to suggest that there is at least some degree of venom in monitors, and apparently varying venom across varying different species of monitors. Very cool. Which is, you know, we talked about that in the venom episode, that Mm -hmm. it's really just specialized saliva. Yes. So you, our saliva has proteins and chemicals in it to do certain jobs. Like sure. It breaks has down the food. Solvents and mm-hmm. things that help to process our food. That our saliva is not just water that we produce in our mouth. So you having saliva that does a little bit of help in killing the thing you bite. <laughs> it's it that is the first steps to venom. Yeah. Now it seems like there is still some back and forth between researchers on how much to consider this venomous Mm -hmm. and how much this venom is actually being used in taking down prey or in defending themselves against potential threats and predators. But at the very least, it seems like there is good evidence that monitor lizards are at least to some degree venomous animals. And this includes Komodo dragons, which would make them probably the largest venomous animals, at least on land. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) In the world. And when it's it, the thing that I find so that's so fun about this is we knew they had a nasty bite mm-hmm. and we thought it was for one reason. And it looks like it might be for another reason, but either way, they have very nasty bites. Right, don't get bitten by these animals. <laughs> it is it, sharp, sharp teeth. <laughs> that's going to make a nasty wound. Cause like that is something I've seen that, that their, their bites are known to be particularly bad for the animal bitten. Like that mm. technique of biting and waiting It's something that's been documented in Komodo dragons. And then the other thing that is interesting and often noted to be special about monitor lizards is their intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, we have talked before on the podcast about the challenges in identifying intelligence in other animal species and how we are very biased in the ways we test for that. Yep. But... (laughs) We all tend to agree (laughs) on what the smartest animal is. Right. (laughs) But at least by our human standards... Monitors are considered pretty smart. I've seen accounts of them uh, known to be recognizing their keepers at zoos. 
showing curiosity. There was at least one study that found that some monitors might have a limited ability to count. <laughs> like they understand small numbers, which is a sign uh, that we use to indicate intelligence. Problem solving. So they've been known, uh, the, the way that we classically test for problem solving in animals is to, you know, hide a bit of food in a difficult container or something and see if they can figure out how to get it out. And monitors do pretty well at that. They also have very dexterous hands. Yeah. Like their 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 front hands are very mobile. They've got those long fingers, so they also they can manipulate stuff better than a lot of lizards. And I found a 2019 study that was the account of two different species at two different zoos exhibiting behavior that these researchers at least interpreted as playing. Haha, <laughs> yes. So these are monitors that what they would do apparently is they would they had a plant, they had like plants in their enclosure. And they would go to the plant and pull off a leaf and then take it over to their favorite perch and then just start ripping it apart <laughs> for apparently no reason. Uh, and these researchers interpreted that as possible playing. Yeah. Which is another sign of advanced cognition, right? Intelligence in an animal species. Which is very cool because like that's those are not behaviors you typically hear of in lizards. Right. So that that's unique. Also, this entire time I'm picturing... Uh, Joanna from uh, Rescuers Down Under trying Joanna the Goanna Joanna the Goanna trying mm -hmm. to crack open the eagle eggs uh, <laughs> is that problem solving <laughs> right yeah they're big they're diverse they're very skilled predators they're smart they're uh, potentially venomous yes they are very impressive lizards they are in my opinion the coolest non-snake lizards that are around today in my opinion, they are the coolest lizards. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, shots fired. It is snake month, sir. You keep those opinions to yourself. No, they are really impressive. They they kind of got that, that Swiss army knife of lizard where it's just, mm -hmm. there's not many places you could plop them that are friendly to lizards. You know, if you drop them in the Arctic, right. they're not going to do great. But like, if you put them someplace where lizards can be... Like Florida. There's at least a monitor that would do well there. Well, I've heard that point made for why they do so well in zoos. Yep. Is that they are able to survive in a wide variety of habitats. At least some species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when the fact that they are a bit more you know, cognitive in their behavior, at least to the way we recognize, that does make... Uh, those kinds of animals are often... I don't want to say easier to work with, mm -hmm. but you're not working against all their instincts when it's an animal that actually might be able to learn how to work and survive with you and adjust its behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so it also makes sense that they are popular as pets. Yeah. Like, I have seen uh, uh, Varanids monitors compared to primates. Yes. And that they're smart, they're dexterous, they're very diverse, they're good at doing a variety of things. That some have called them the primates among lizards. Now, of course, the ones who call them that are primates themselves. I mean, so you know, we're I very biased. Can't think of a higher compliment <laughs> to give them. Uh, that does make me want. If any artists are out there wanting something to draw of uh, monitor people, like that's what uh, I want. It's going to be like that dinosaur person. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's what I want my <laughs> lizard folk to be based off of from now oh, on. Oh man, like. Yeah. That's what you should be basing them off monitors, because that's... The best lizards. If anyone's going to stand up that's true. and start using tools, it's going to be monitors. <laughs> now, we've talked about a bunch of their cool lifestyles, biology, behavior. Let's touch on a bit of evolution before we move back into the fossil record. Where monitors fit on the lizard family tree. Now, we have discussed this occasionally from time to time in the past on the podcast that the lizard family tree is kind of a mess. A bit. We uh, scientists have had a hard time figuring out exactly what groups are related to what groups. This has been exacerbated in the last couple of decades by genetic studies, which really changed a lot of stuff on the lizard family tree. So there are all sorts of open questions about exactly what the relationships are between different groups of lizards. But one thing that is generally agreed upon is that monitors belong to a group of lizards called the anguamorphs. Anguamorphs is a group that includes most of the best lizards. <laughs> uh, it includes varanids, 
are monitor lizards. It includes Hylodermatids, which are your beaded lizards, Mexican beaded lizards, and Gila monsters from the southwestern U.S. and Mexico, Central America. The, like, definitely straight-up venomous lizards. Yes. Like... <laughs> the, the only lizards in the world that are confirmed dangerous to humans with their venom. Yeah, like, do not get bitten by these. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got monitors, you've got beaded lizards, and then you've got a group called anguids, which includes glass lizards, uh, golly wasps are in there, alligator lizards are in there. Nice. Most of the members of this group also tend to have osteoderms. Cool. And then there are a few others. The closest relatives within this group to monitors are a group called the earless monitor lizards. This is one species, Lanthanotus borneensis, which is a nocturnal species of lizards that lives on Borneo and some other nearby islands. These are, t- from what I've read, considered to be just outside of true monitor lizards, closest to them than anywhere else. Oh, okay. This is a very little known species. Another single species off on its own in its own little family that might be closely related to monitors is Shinisaurus, Chinese crocodile lizards. Oh. These live in China and Vietnam. They are semi-aquatic. So earless monitors are considered very close to monitor lizards. Crocodile lizards, possibly pretty close to them. And then you've got your beaded lizards and your anguids all within Anguamorpha. Now, this sort of corner of the lizard family tree has long been considered to probably be closely related to snakes. Yes. But exactly how closely related has varied over time. Again, the lizard family tree keeps getting shifted. The popular hypothesis these days, so in the recent decade, decade and a half, there has been lots and lots of genetic support for a grouping called Toxicophora. Oh, I have heard of that. And this is a group, uh, this was started with a study back in 2006 or so, uh, which I think was the first one to popularize this idea that found that there is a group of lizard chunk, chunk bits of the family tree that share venom, Mm -hmm. or at least the proteins for venom and that unites them in this Toxicophora group. Under this Toxicophora hypothesis, the anguamorphs, including our monitors, are closely related to the group called Iguania, which includes iguanas, collared lizards, chameleons, uh, your bearded dragons are in here, anoles, and a bunch of these other uh, iguana and relative lizards. And then the closest group to those two are snakes. All right. So yeah. Toxicophora suggests that snakes and monitor lizards are still pretty closely related, but also iguanas and their cousins are all in there. Which was a very controversial hypothesis when it was first put forth, <laughs> uh, partially because previous uh, suggestions of the lizard, the shape of the lizard family tree had iguanas basically all the way on the other side of the family tree. Yeah. But it sounds like more and more studies keep supporting this format of the tree. Neat. All that is to say that regardless of the shape of your lizard family tree, One of the reasons that monitors are so incredibly cool is just because it runs in the family. Yeah. They're closely related to snakes. (laughs) What else can you expect (laughs) from a group that is kind of sort of closely related to snakes? (laughs) It is neat noting that you've got a bunch of venomous reptiles and that that could be a linking factor. You know, that, that might be a bit of evidence to the evolutionary history of these various groups. Of... It, it would indicate that they are ancestrally venomous. Mm-hmm. So any of them that aren't venomous today are either very weakly venomous or have lost their venom. Yeah. If that is indeed that evolutionary trajectory. Which then brings up all sorts of questions of like, how venomous would that ancestor have been? Or mm-hmm. would you? did you just have all the right proteins, but you weren't actually using them as a venom right but all all the building blocks were already there waiting to ready to go just ready to go and so you had that acceptation that using that previous thing to then make a bunch of venomous groups Mm -hmm. Ooh, interesting for more on venom episode 97 is when we talked about that now that's a whole lot about monitors and their biology and where they fit on the tree i think it is time to go into the past Talk about paleontology? Uh, Talk about paleontology on our paleontology podcast. Oh. After the break, let's go all the way back to what we know about the early evolution of monitor lizards. 
When we go through the fossil record, there are a lot of ancient lizards that have been identified as being potentially ancestral to or close to monitor lizards. They are varyingly often called varanoids. <laughs> so they're not varanids, they're varanoids. Or I've also seen the term varaniform. Ooh. So similar to varanids, to true monitors. Uh, a lot of these uh, mainly get started in the Cretaceous period. We have some coming closer into the early Cenozoic. I believe there are at least some in the Jurassic period that are thought to potentially be in this near monitor area of the family tree. Okay. But there are many of these ancient lizards, and they have been regularly identified and re-identified and shifted to different parts of the tree, kind of like we've been doing with the modern lizard family tree. So there are a number of species that were thought to be close to monitors, but then they were re-identified as instead being closer to beaded lizards or instead closer to some other group. So there's just a whole bunch of these names. Telmasaurus, Paleovarinus, Ovuo, Alosaurus, Proplatinotia, and more that will commonly come up when you go looking through the literature of monitor evolution. Some of those names are no longer considered appropriately linked with monitors. There is an outdated genus name, Necrosaurus. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Which I believe has been synonymized. I think that's Paleovaranus uh, or, or Paleosaniwa. It's one of those, which is a real shame because Necrosaurus is a great genus name. Right? <laughs> so there's just this whole variety. There's a bunch of them in late Cretaceous Asia, especially that have been identified as probably close to monitor lizards. This variety of varanoids includes both terrestrial and aquatic lizards. Okay. So things that are aquatic or semi-aquatic, like a lot of monitors are today. And, of course, there are mosasaurs, and their related aquatic, like truly aquatic reptiles, that have in the past been considered part of the monitor lineage, that they're closely related to monitors, although more recent studies have suggested that mosasaurs and their cousins are potentially closer related to snakes. Right. So mosasaurs and things like delicosaurs and these other ocean-dwelling lizards might be in that near monitor ancient lineage, but they might also be closer to snakes. I'm cool either way. Monitor uh, the <laughs> Mosasaurs are a, a an improvement to any lineage that they happen to be a part of. Yeah, that'd be the feather of anybody's cap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Varanoids, things that are close to monitors, have been found in the fossil record all over the world. The only continents they haven't been found on are South America and Antarctica. Many ancient species are known from Asia and Europe, also North America, so they were very widespread, this ancestral batch that monitors ultimately emerged from. That's pretty crazy that they have never been South American. Yeah, like, they've just never made it there. Like, we don't have them today, and they weren't there fossil-wise. Like, that's... It always is weird to me when it's like, this group has never touched this landmass. Yeah, this continent has just been monitor-free forever. That's it's that's weird. I bet there are some invasives down there. Yeah. And if was... there aren't now, there probably will be soon. <laughs> so Europe, Asia, very uh, a common fossil record of these var varanid relatives. They were in North America, although they seem to go extinct in North America during the Oligocene, so 20, 30 million years ago. Okay. By the Cretaceous period, so in that 100 to 80 million years ago or so, a lot of these lizards already seem to be showing a very monitor-like body shape. Already kind of recognizably. Kind of looking like monitors. So there's a good chance that if you went back to the Cretaceous, you'd spot a few lizards that you might think were monitors. Yeah, you'd go, oh, that kind of looks like a mon the monitors I know. Yep. That's cool. True monitors, so varanids, the family that we have today, the oldest uh, commonly cited are from the Eocene, so 40, 50 million years old in Europe, with ancient remains of at or near that age, also known from Africa and North America. 
A number of studies have suggested that Varanids, Varanidae, the monitor family, originated in Eurasia. Okay. Europe and Asia area and dispersed from there. They are known in Africa by at least the middle Eocene. They're known in Australia during the Oligocene. So it seems like they may have started in Eurasia and then spread out to other continents. Like I said, in North America, they go extinct by about 30 million years ago. And in Europe, they were recently, uh, previously thought to go extinct during the Pliocene, so a few million years ago. But I found a study from 2017 that identified possible Varanid remains from Greece from the Middle Pleistocene. Oh, wow. So like a million years ago or so. So they might actually have persisted in Europe until very recently, geologically speaking. That's pretty interesting. So the family of monitors has this long running, a good 50 million years or so of history, particularly in the old world with some offshoots potentially in North America. And what we have today, as with so many modern groups, is what's left of the range they used to be farther north up until potentially pretty recently like i said there's a whole bunch of different ancient species that are considered to be either within this lineage or near this lineage or possibly ancestral to this lineage and there's a bunch of confusion and we're still working out the kinks there are a few particular genera that i want to highlight because they're important and their names come up the first and Almost certainly the most famous, like, well-known, longest-studied ancient monitor or monitor cousin is a fossil lizard called Saniwa. Saniwa is from the Eocene of North America about 50 million years ago. There are well-preserved specimens known from the famous Green River Formation in Wyoming. This is one of those formations that gives you those beautiful fossil fish, like just a chunk of rock with just a fish skeleton in it yep. from 50 million years ago. They're not only known from there. These lizards are known from elsewhere. The type species of Saniwa is Saniwa incidens. There have been other species named, although it sounds like a lot of them have been re-identified or have been synonymized. But Saniwa incidens, this ancient species, is, as I've seen it called, the most widely accepted and most completely known ancient monitor or potentially monitor cousin so either in this family or very close to this family also i apparently i have seen it referred to as the first fossil lizard identified in north america oh really back in 1870 saniwa was given its name saniwa was about one to two meters long so three to six feet which is a decent size that's a monitor size. like that's that's pretty good and by all accounts looked like a monitor lizard Long tail, long, flat skull with a pointy snout. Uh, In fact, one study that I read pointed out that that skull shape is probably really good for catching fast-moving prey. Oh, yeah. But Saniwa has a number of differences uh, in the construction of the skull. So just the way the bones are put together is different from modern monitors. And also, Saniwa has more teeth in its mouth. Really? It has teeth on its palatal bone. So, in a lot of lizards, there are teeth. So, we've got teeth on the maxilla and premaxilla, which is basically what you think of as teeth, the yep. row of teeth around the outside of the upper jaw, like us. But a lot of lizards have teeth on the roof of the mouth. Mm-hmm. There are two bones that commonly have teeth, the pterygoid, which is further back, and the palatine or palatal bone, which is further up. Typically, the, the teeth just make a single row that runs across both bones. I believe that's what it does in snakes. Yep. Monitors have teeth on the pterygoid, which is farther back, but not on the palatal bone. Snakes tend to have both. A lot of other lizards tend to have both. Monitors have lost that, but Saniwa retains it. So this was a more toothy monitor lizard from back in the Eocene. That's interesting. There's also been some discussion about what Saniwa's habitat was like. And it sounds like we don't know because it's hard to nail down. Okay. Apparently there was at least one study that compared its body proportions to modern day monitor lizards and found that it could be arboreal, tree dwelling, 
or semi-aquatic. <laughs> Which honestly sounds pretty monitor-esque to me. I was about to say, this feels <laughs> like it would be a tough group to nail down a habitat based on body shape. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of your monitors do very well in varied habitats. Yeah. So, like... So this thing might very well have been living like a monitor lizard back in the Eocene. That's very cool. A couple other cool notes about Saniwa. Uh, One complete skeleton described back in 2007 includes, because this is Green River style preservation, a bunch of soft tissue remains, Mm -hmm. which allowed researchers to describe patches of skin and scales, some cartilaginous bones, so bones that hadn't fully formed yet. I believe the specimen is thought to have been still growing, a juvenile specimen, so not all the bones had fully formed. Cool. And also the rings of the trachea, <laughs> <laughs> which are also cartilage. So we we know this lizard really well. This is a very well-preserved lizard. That's so awesome. <laughs> and then the other thing, if any listeners to our podcast are wondering, have I, haven't I heard the name Saniwa before? The answer is yes. It came up in a news that we talked about back in 2018 because a study f- that determined that Saniwa had an extra eye. Yes. Yep. yep Remember yep. this one? Yep. So many animals today, including fish, amphibians, reptiles, have a quote unquote third eye, which is a small photosensitive organ on the top of the head that can detect light. And it's often... Uh, helps with circadian rhythm and just the sort of general day-to-day cycles of the animals. This study took an x-ray of at least one Saniwa skull and found two third eyes, one in front of the other on the top of the head. I had forgotten that there were two. Yeah, the four-eyed lizard. Weird. And this was cool because it allowed them to determine an evolutionary distinction between what we see in reptiles and what we see in fish and amphibians. That in fish and amphibians, the organ that is photosensitive on the top of the head, I'm pointing at the top of my head Uh for all the listeners. I keep doing this for Will's benefit, I guess. This is where the top of the head is, Will. It's right up here. I always wondered if you had one of those. (laughs) What do you have up there? It's kind (laughs) of. In fish and amphibians, the organ is the pineal organ. But in lizards and in some things like lampreys, it's the parapineal organ. It's a different organ. In Saniwa, apparently both organs had an eye on the top of the head. In the fossils, they found two spaces where the eyes would be. And again, these aren't a pair of eyes. It is one in front of the other, just two different organs that both did the same thing. And this was part this study helped to confirm the organ origin of the lizard third eye. That it there had been debate over what organ formed that eye. This fossil helped to go, no, no, it does look like lizards are using the parapineal organ, whereas fish and amphibians are using the pineal organ. Because they finally got to see, oh, that's what it would look like if they were using the pineal organ. Yes, there's (laughs) one that has it. (laughs) That's what a lizard pineal organ eye would look like. That's not what these look like. (laughs) So Saniwa is our North American, exceptionally well-known, four-eyed monitor lizard. Amazing. Well, it's so neat like, you know, a lot of times when we talk about fossil groups, you know, we'll go through some of the ones that stand out from today's, mm-hmm. you know, that are particularly weird. And Saniwa does not sound like it was particularly weird as a monitor. That like It mm-hmm. looked like a monitor. You know, it would have potentially been acting and moving around in its environment like a monitor. But it's still got some weird stuff to it. Yeah. But it's also just, it's awesome when there's a group that we know really well. That's always very pleasing and exciting especially in fossils exactly that's what i mean like in a fossil group it's not very often that we have one that we can say well we actually know a lot about this one especially lizards yeah we don't get that reptiles in general we don't get that with lizards very much now saniwa for a long time has been considered the closest fossil cousin to varanus our modern group of monitor lizards but a different lizard species was described earlier this year, oh? early 2022, from the early Eocene of China that is thought to be even closer. This is early Eocene, 50 million years old again, a well-preserved skull and skeleton that they've named Archaeovarinus lii, which is very similar to Varinus, the modern genus of monitors. 
Archaeovarinus is estimated to have been about a meter long, so a few feet long. Very much like modern monitors with a couple of notable differences. One is that, again, it has those palatal teeth. Okay. Still has those extra teeth on the roof of the mouth, which these authors point out the presence of those teeth might indicate that it was still using its tongue for prey manipulation in its mouth. Oh, okay. And that those teeth are apparently and potentially used in concert with a tongue moving things back farther in the mouth. And if that's true, it could be that this was a monitor that was using its tongue for not just a sensory function, but also to help move food around. Okay, that makes sense. So that might be one of the reasons those teeth are still there if they were a part of this tongue-tooth collaboration. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting that they note as difference about Archaeovarinus is that its front and back legs are about the same length. Mm. Which is different from modern monitors where the back legs are longer than the front legs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they point out that this might indicate that Archaeovarinus was moving in a particular way, although they don't know what way that would be. Yeah. <laughs> there was a note in the paper that said something to the effect of, like, we don't have a good comparison for this. So we don't know what it would have been doing with this weird leg proportions, but probably something different from what we're used to. I love when we get <laughs> fossil groups to where it's like, uh, I don't know how you're getting around because that's weird. Mm -hmm. like, you just don't look like things we're familiar with. Yep. Yeah, so we, we there's nothing <laughs> that our minds can jump to. Interesting. And Archaeovarinus, at least according to that study, and I should point out again that so many of these ancient monitor and potential monitor cousins keep have gotten shuffled around at least according to this study that came out a number of months ago Archaeovarinus seems to be the closest fossil cousin to the genus varinus that we still have today all right and then the third important group of fossil monitor lizards are the genus varinus oh hey i know those we have fossils of the modern genus they are not common Mostly, this uh, monitors are known from isolated vertebrae, so one vertebra at a time. The earliest members of this genus, uh, back in 1995, there was a study that identified a species Varanus rusingensis from Kenya in the early Miocene. And for a long time, that has been considered the oldest known member of the modern genus. A 2010 study identified potential Varanus remains from Egypt, from the late Eocene, early Oligocene. So if that's correct, they might go back as far as about 30 million years ago. If not, the, that earlier find would suggest closer to 20 million years ago. Okay. So somewhere in the 20 to 30 million years ago is where our earliest fossil evidence of the modern genus is. Not too bad. And the fact that both of those are in Africa has led some researchers to suspect that the family may have originated northern of in Eurasia, but the genus, monitor lizards as we know them, may have gotten their start in Africa and then dispersed from there. All right. The genus is found in both Eurasia and Australia by the early to middle Miocene. And indeed, during the Miocene, so in that sort of 20 to 5 million years ago, there is a wide variety and abundance of monitor lizard fossils in Europe. That tons of different countries in Europe have relatively well-known monitor fossils. So this is a group that did a really did did a really well farther north in the past. Huh. So monitors as we know them, Varanus, the modern genus, has been around and pretty widespread since the Miocene up until today. It is also in the Miocene and moving toward the present that we start to see a new trend in the monitor lizard lineage. And that is a trend in giant monitors. Yeah. There have been a lot of studies examining body size evolution in monitor lizards, which makes total sense because if you are scientists and you look at the world and you notice that a particular group of lizards is getting really big, you want to know why. Yeah, like not just that, you know, oh, this is a group of big lizards. This is the group that makes of, of big lizards. the biggest lizards. <laughs> Early monitors and their relatives, so a lot of those members that we've been talking about were generally pretty small. Mm -hmm. So a few feet long, probably 
at least one study that I found noted that this might be because earlier, like back in the Cretaceous, other lizards were getting really big. No. So there were other big lizards and the monitors and their relatives couldn't do it yet. Most monitors today are pretty small. So most monitors were talking, you know, a few feet long or so. They tend not to be huge lizards on the whole. But over the last 20, 15 million years, we see this trend in bigger and bigger species. So that ancient Varanus that I mentioned, Rusingensis from Kenya, had a body length, so snout to vent length, but with a skeleton. Mm -hmm. So rostrum to... Hipple area. (laughs) Hipple hipple region (laughs) of about half a meter. So total length could have been between one and one and a half meters long, which is pretty big. A study not too long ago, I think 2012, identified a different species from late Miocene Greece that might have been more one and a half, maybe up to two meters long. So these are the earliest known big, true monitor lizards. Uh, That study noted that that lizard is larger than 85% of known Varanus species, (laughs) which makes it giant. Another species along these lines from the late Pliocene of India, so late Pliocene, now we're in like three million years ago, Varanus civilensis, also noted to be pretty big, as big as a lot of the big ones we have today, possibly as big as Komodo dragons. Wow. I was just wondering if we had like how much of the size range we Mm -hmm. had. So in the late Pliocene, we have potential Komodo dragon-sized monitors in India. And then from the Pliocene through the Pleistocene, we see a bunch of our modern giant groups show up. So today we have water monitors and in Southeast Asia and Parentes in Australia, which both get quite large. And then, of course, Komodo dragons in Australia with fossils in both Australia and Indonesia, where they still live today. There are potentially some other fossil giant monitors across this region. That diversity of monitor giants also suggests that there were multiple origins of giant size, that those sizes have been reached by at least a couple different lineages of monitor lizards. Yep, yep, yep. But yep. there is a record holder. I was going to say, I, could, <laughs> I can feel the listeners. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> They're out there going, all right, that's the end of the episode. I hope, I hope we didn't miss anything. <laughs> the largest known monitor lizard in history, and indeed the largest terrestrial lizard in the fossil record or modern, is Megalania. Megalania, whose scientific name, confusingly enough, is Varanus Priscus. Yes. Uh, Megalania was originally supposed to be the genus name. It was Megalania Prisca, but more recent studies have identified it as just within the variety of the Varanus genus. Mm -hmm. So it is Varanus Priscus, but Megalania has become the common name for it. Yes. Like that's just what, it's like Mastodon. Mastodon uh, has the similar, the same thing as this, where Mastodon was originally meant to be a genus name for those elephants. And then it got synonymized with Mammut, and the name Mastodon got dropped scientifically, but it stuck around as the colloquial name for this animal. Yeah. We just call them Mastodons. Yeah. We just call this lizard Megalania because that is no longer its scientific name, but it's a super cool name, so we keep using it. Megalania is known from the Pleistocene of Eastern Australia. I've seen notes that it seems to show up around one and a half million years ago. And it persists until not long after about 50,000 years ago, so pretty recent. Megalania is known from partial remains of many different body parts, so we have a decent understanding of the animal. We don't have, like, a full skeleton. We've got bits and pieces, but all together they give us a pretty okay picture of the creature. Mm -hmm. Because the remains are partial, size estimates vary a lot. (laughs) But you will commonly see sighted body length estimates between four and six meters long. So 15 to 20 feet and estimated weights of at least 200 to 300 kilograms. That is about 500 to 700 pounds. Some estimates have gone even bigger. So there have been some estimates uh, as big as seven meters and 600 kilograms. So more than half of a ton. Uh, I think some of the biggest estimates have been challenged regardless This was a monitor lizard that was about as long as a good-sized crocodile. Yep, like, even at the very smallest of those size estimates, 
it is like half again as big as the biggest Komodo dragons. Yes. And but potentially hit- twice as long as Komodo dragons. Yep. And if it's hitting those sizes, it is hitting the size of the largest crocs today. Yep. Like that's a big lizard. Yeah. Now, as with most monitors, a lot of that's going to be tail. Oh yeah. So they're not going to be anywhere near as heavy as a big croc, <laughs> but that is a very large lizard. Like I said, the largest known terrestrial lizards in history. Yeah. Well, and they're also going to be more leg. Like Yes, that's true. They're, they're not going to be that <laughs> that wide just fat belly with the little legs. <laughs> Now, we don't know a ton about their lifestyle and habits because we just don't have that much direct evidence of those things. They lived in Australia throughout the Pleistocene, which means they lived alongside the Pleistocene megafauna there. Things like Diprotodon and the marsupial lions and Quincana, that potentially terrestrial croc that we've talked about. Yep. Also, Wanambi, the big Australian Pleistocene snake that lived down there. Yeah, we were talking about how cool... Florida is now with all its invasive species. That's that's the place. <laughs> that's to what be. it looked. Yeah, this is that's what Australia used to be like. <laughs> and given that the youngest remains of Megalania are a bit younger than fifty thousand years old, it potentially also overlapped with the earliest humans in Australia, who get there about fifty thousand years ago or so. So it is possible that ancient Australians met this giant lizard. Yeah, we may have interacted with Megalania. <laughs> which, oof, good luck. Yeah, that, just keep your distance. Well, because like, Stay to, safe. today, Komodo dragons are a potential threat oh, yeah. to the humans that live on the islands they're found on. Like, they are a notable, like, you, you need to be, you, you need to be Komodo wise. Yes. If you're going <laughs> to live there, because these are animals that take down stuff the size of deer and ox Mm -hmm. so they will absolutely take down a person that's on their menu size list megalania we would be absolutely like smack dab in the middle of their menu oh yeah it it would be so easy for them to take down something human size you would have to be as careful around megalania in that territory as any crocs as Thylaca Leo. Yeah. And your marsupial large carnivores. Yeah, that's just one more big predator on the landscape yep. to keep an eye out for. Oh. Overall, uh, the anatomy of Megalania has led a lot of researchers to suggest that it was very similar to Komodo dragons. So, probably looked very similar, probably lived very similar, potentially also venomous. <laughs> so, that one venom study. Pointed out that, yeah, there's enough similarities between these two, and they're probably closely related, so this might also have been a venomous animal, which is just overkill. (laughs) Uh, Fun fact, Megalania was first identified back in 1859. Uh, Richard Owen named it, and uh, way back then identified its similarity to monitor lizards. This is an uh, interesting note because it means that Megalania was known to Western scientists several decades before Komodo dragons were known to Western scientists. Weird. That these scientists were out there, you know, traveling across the world to go to Australia and digging up these bones and going, my my goodness, a giant monitor used to live here. Uh-huh. And imagine their surprise <laughs> a number of decades later. Oh, look, a moderately sized <laughs> monitor. <laughs> That's, it's very funny to go the opposite direction. Right. To find the biggest well, I, first. I, I like the thought of them just going, they're still here. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> now, Komodo dragons have attracted lots of attention for the question of their evolution, especially for, for their body size. So we're talking about Megalania and Megalania is preposterously large. But let us not let that overshadow the fact that Komodo dragons are giant lizards. Yes, they are. They are equally preposterously large when you take them out of context. Yes. In the modern context, without without Megalania, it's still preposterous. They are giant monitor. That, that, that they are an example of gigantism. They have evolved to be huge. Uh, not just them. Parentes, water monitors. There are a bunch of big ones. Komodo dragons have been the subject of a lot of questions surrounding the the topic of why are you so big? Yeah. What led to this evolution? The fact that Komodo dragons live mainly on islands has led a lot of people to suggest that they may be the an example of island size change. So we've talked about this on the podcast a bunch of times. 
animal species that live on islands tend to change size. Mm -hmm. You can have island gigantism, where they get bigger, island dwarfism, where they get smaller. A number of researchers have suggested that Komodo dragons might be island giants, that they got bigger on those islands. Um, I've seen it suggested in some places. I don't know how common this has been suggested, that they might be island dwarfs, <laughs> yeah. that their ancestors were megalania-sized, and they're actually the small version. I don't know how widely proposed that has been. It's like the, the dwarf elephants, the, right. the island dwarf elephants, where right. it's like, you're still, like, cow-sized uh, right. for a lot of you. Because, like... Well, it's like the dwarf sauropods. Yeah. yeah. You're, still, you're still a big <laughs> animal. Just compared to the other versions of you, you are not nearly as big. It's also been suggested that Komodo dragons might be that size because they are evolved as specialized hunters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of certain large ancient animals, certain large ancient marsupials and such that lived on those islands and they were able to hunt them specifically and get or stay big. There is one study from not too long ago that addressed this question in detail, Hocknull et al. 2009. And they talked about a bit of what we know about the evolutionary past of Komodo dragons. For one thing, their origins are almost certainly in Australia. So the fossil record suggests they come from Australia. A molecular study suggests they come from Australia. There are giant monitors, Varanus, known in Australia throughout the Pleistocene, including Komodo dragons, including Megalania, possibly others. Cool. There, there may have been several species of giant monitor lizards in Australia in the Pleistocene. Nice. Komodo dragons likely evolved in Australia first and then moved to Indonesian islands. The oldest Komodo dragon fossils on these islands are about 900,000 years old and already big. And as far as this study determined, that size has remained pretty consistent since then throughout those hundreds of thousands of years, even though during that time there were various extinctions and turnovers and prey species have come and gone. And those authors point out that if their size was about the specific environment on the island, in particular their diet and such, we'd expect them to change with those ecological changes. Yeah, we should see some shift somewhere. If they were specialized hunters on big prey and that's why they were big, then they should have changed when the prey went extinct. If they were reliant on the ecology of the islands to be big, then that should have changed when various extinctions happened. And this sheds some doubt on the idea that they're insular for their size, that it's island size. The authors also point out that a bunch of the other giant monitors that I've already mentioned on this episode lived on the mainland. Mm -hmm. Lived in Australia, lived in India, right? That that Civilensis species was in the mainland. In both cases, they existed alongside large mammalian carnivores and other competitors. So those examples suggest that you don't need to be on an island to evolve Komodo dragon size. Yeah. So their conclusion from all of this evidence is that Komodo dragons probably are in a special case. They might instead be a very generalist, flexible species that evolved to be big along with a collection of giant Australian monitors and then are adaptable and generalized enough to have stayed that way. Yeah, which makes a ton of sense, Like especially if we mm -hmm. don't have a record of small Komodo dragons. Yeah, it doesn't sound like we have a record of them getting bigger. They evolved among a lineage of giant monitors, and they're just the the last of those really giant monitors that yeah. are around today. Yeah, so hey, this is a situation of a giant monitor on an island, not an island giant monitor. Yes. <laughs> and it's possible that they disappeared from mainland Australia around the same time that a lot of the other giant things were disappearing toward the end of the Pleistocene. Episode 25 for more on that. And that these islands are just the place they've managed to hang on. Yeah, that the reason we have giant monitors on these islands is not because they were getting, they were able to get big here, but because this is where they were able to survive. Yes. That these acted as refugia for this, for Komodo dragons, which is also very, very cool. Very cool. 
So I think that it is a pretty obvious statement then that there's a lot we still don't know about Monitor Evolution. Yeah. About their specific relationships, about exactly where they originated, about how they're related to certain ancient lizards, about what drives the varying sizes in their, the different species body size. There's a lot of fascinating open questions about this group. It's, it's always intriguing when we have a group of animals that are extremely famous, like monitor lizards are very, very popular, often discussed, you know, very well known among people. And it's not, it's not mm-hmm. like we're, we're discussing this one small species of Amazonian lizard right. that or crocodile lizard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, this is uh, monitors are known very, very well to us people. But yet there's still a bunch of things that we are trying to parse out, both like evolutionarily and in the fossil record, which those often have mm-hmm. big questions because it's we are dealing with incomplete pictures whenever we're dealing with evolution or fossils. Right. But also like, are you venomous? Right. <laughs> and like, we just discovered. Do the com- you have osteoderms? Yes, we just discovered the, the complexity of the armor you have. And like, yeah, so we're still learning a lot of fundamental things just about the living Mm-hmm. attributes of this group and the living members of this group so there there's a lot to learn about them well and what i like so much is that as i was going through different studies that have been done and these cool new discoveries osteoderm variety and venom and parthenogenesis and all that every new thing we learn about monitors makes them cooler right they're such cool lizards like they they are a worthy inclusion in our snake month discussions. <laughs> they are cousins of snakes and they are, they runs in the family being awesome. <laughs> well, I love it so much with Komodo dragons and being like, well, if, if you're going to call me dragon, like, did you also know that I might have venomous saliva? Right. Uh, I also have armor. My scales. Yeah, I'm, I'm armored. Are like, <laughs> <laughs> are like shields. <laughs> My teeth like swords. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, they're pretty awesome. Yeah. Listeners, I fully encourage you to go to the internet and look up videos of monitor lizards. Oh, yeah. Just they're so cool. For your own well-being. If you want to learn more about them, there will be a blog post at the end of this episode. Link in the episode description. And indeed, there will be pictures of both modern monitor lizards and some of the cool fossil material that we have of monitors. Very cool group. Very excited to get to talk to them. Finally, a an episode about a modern-day lizard group. Right. <laughs> yeah, 143 episodes in. This is our <laughs> third visit to the lizard family tree, and the other two were snakes and mosasaurs. Yep. Yep. Now, before we wrap up the episode, we do have one last thing to do, and that is our patron question. Yay! One of the benefits that patrons can get by supporting us on our Patreon at uh, a certain level is the ability to ask us questions for us to answer here on the podcast. Now, a shout out to a patron question from Zabby, <laughs> who asked, is the Komodo dragon an example of island gigantism, island dwarfism, or neither? Hey, we discussed that. Yep, there you so, go. There you go, Zabby. Great question. Fascinating answer. And because we talked about that, we're going to do another patron question. Will, what do we got? <gasps> We have a question from Charlie, who says, A recent Radio Lab episode titled Fungus Among Us yeah. mentioned a hypothesis that fungi are the reason mammals thrived after the KPG extinction instead of reptiles. Does it have much support in the scientific community? An interesting question. I had to do some digging because I had not heard this before. Yeah, this is the first time I'm hearing this idea. So what my digging turned up is that there is a hypothesis that suggests that fungi acted as a filter Mm -hmm. at the end of the Cretaceous and mammals did better through the filter than reptiles. This has been titled the Fungal Infection Mammalian Selection Hypothesis. (laughs) And here's the here's the sort of the foundation of it. Uh, We know that there was a lot of fungal activity at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, Apocalyptic landscape was great for fungi. There's a massive spike in fungal spores and fungal evidence Fungi did really well in uh, amidst all the death Mm -hmm. at the end of the Cretaceous. This hypothesis points out that mammals tend to be more resistant to fungal infection, a large part because of just higher body temperatures. 
make it harder for fungi to get a hold, and also that mammal babies are theoretically safer from fungal infections because they're inside the warm body of a parent instead of being eggs out in the open where they can get infected. The hypothesis suggests that at the end of the Cretaceous, in the aftermath of the KPG extinction, episode 5, all that fungus activity was potentially a source of lots and lots of fungal infections, and mammals being more resistant to fungus did better than reptiles, and that is why mammals went to take over in the Cenozoic instead of reptiles rising again to dominance. That's the hypothesis. As to the question of how much support does it have in the scientific community, I had never heard this before. Nope. And as far as I can tell, this hypothesis is mostly proposed by one person. The person in question is Arturo Casadevall, who is a doctor and microbiologist. Uh, it looks like uh, the proposal was first made about 15, 20 years ago, and there have been a couple of published notes about it since then. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's all this one person. Uh, it, it feels like this one person's pet hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And as far as support, I'm not surprised that it hasn't taken off and gathered a lot of support from other scientists. Yeah, no. Well, partially just because there's not any real direct evidence for that. Yes, it's like, a cool idea. Like, your your logic is, you know, decently sound. I, like, right. this is a logical hypothesis. Lots of fungi, potential for lots of fungal infections. If one group resists fungal infections more than another, that could certainly have an impact on the recovery of those different groups. Yeah. But yeah, I've I've never heard of any fossil evidence that supports it. You know, pathological specimens or anything that shows signs of f fungal infection or something mm -hmm. like that. I also like I definitely know that there are some really intense reptilian funguses, but I don't know how much worse fungus is for reptiles than mammal. Like, is it right. is it really that much worse? Like, are mammals really that much more resistant? Because we still get fungal infections, like yeah. yeast and athlete's foot type stuff. Like we we still get attacked by funguses fairly often. And I'm sure that this person knows more about fungal infections than we do, yes. being a microbiologist. This hypothesis is reminiscent, especially the way that it is proposed. So in that Radio Lab episode, they talk about it in very simple, cut and dry terms. Yeah. Of why did mammals take off after the KPG? After the extinction, why didn't reptiles rule again? And the answer is fungus. On the one hand, there's not really any direct evidence for that. Again, yeah. cool idea. Sound logic. Yeah. But there's not really direct evidence. And the extinction and recovery after the extinction is such a long, drawn out, complex ecological process that it doesn't really make a lot of sense, I think, to point to one factor and say... That was the decision maker yes, I, between who took off afterwards. I can't think of a single extinction event or just ecological example today that is that simple. Mm -hmm. That is that easy an answer. Right. Uh, not to say that there, that doesn't mean it couldn't be the answer, but to jump to that that is the answer because it makes sense. We've run into those and done away with those kind of hypotheses many, many times throughout Right. Our, our understanding of specifically that extinction, but extinctions in general, like it, it's almost ecosystems are basically never that simplistic. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not likely maybe it played a role, but it's not likely the reason. Right. This sounds like the kind of hypothesis that if we find evidence, uh, there's some fossil site with like great evidence of fungal infections, whoever publishes on that site might call back to this yes. and say, oh, hey, remember that hypothesis? And here's potential support for something like that. And like I said, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the sort of takeover of fungus for a while in the world had impacts on the ecosystems at the time. Yep. I'd, I'd also be very interested to see actual numbers to reptiles versus mammals and fungal affections. Like, mm -hmm. How, how are there a notably larger number of funguses that attack reptiles yeah, yeah. because of their exposed eggs? Uh, I know that scales, like their skin, mm -hmm. they get fungal skin infections. Yeah. And there are a number of really devastating 
fungal infections. So in amphibians today yep. and in snakes today, yep. snake fungal disease. But there's also like white nose syndrome. Yeah, in bats. In bats, so, which is a mammalian devastating fungal infection. That I'd, And it's like I said, I'm not saying that that's not that this person is incorrect about reptiles being more. I've just never heard it said that way. Mm-hmm. And so I'd want to see some numbers like can we actually chart? I think one of the facets of the idea was that mammals maintain a high body temperature, whereas reptiles have to get to a high body mm-hmm. temperature to fight off infection. And in the post KPG world, it would have been harder to raise the body temperature with limited sunlight and with ecological, you know, food reserves being harder to come yeah. by. So it might have been that it was harder for reptiles to mount defenses against fungal infection yeah. versus mammals. So I, I'm sure there's a fascinating discussion to be had. And I read through the papers and it's a very interesting ecological musings. Yes. But to answer the question, how much support does this idea have in the scientific community? It seems very little not that it's been like soundly rejected. Yeah, yeah. The, just that it's an intriguing idea that hasn't yet gone anywhere. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't have like opposition that's aggressively uh, shooting it down. It just and neither of us had heard of it, so it's not making a big right. enough splash <laughs> to be a a foundational discussion of the post KPG world. And I don't think it's been cited in many places. Yeah, like the papers that have mentioned it that I found are all the same person sort of proposing it and refining it. So it, it does seem to still be a, a bit of a pet hypothesis. Yeah. So intriguing idea, and perhaps we'll hear more about it in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie and Zabby, for those patron questions. Thank you to all of our patrons, uh, old and new, the patrons who've been joining us for Croc and Snake Month. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you to our requesters. Thank you to all of our listeners. Be sure to check out the blog post after this episode for more links and images related to monitors. Link in the description. As we mentioned, it is Snake Month. Woo! So we've got Snake Month stuff going on all throughout July. Social media stuff, Discord stuff, Patreon stuff. We have a new patron tier where you can help us contribute to donations to conservation efforts. Please consider doing that. Links to all that stuff down in the episode description. If you missed the Croc Month stuff from last month, go check that stuff out too. Also, links in the episode description to the organizations that we mentioned at the top of the episode donating to. Check those out if you want to read more about what's being done and what can be done to address these health rights issues that we are currently facing here in the United States. And, as usual, we release new episodes every fortnight. Yeah, so continue to monitor... Oh, your podcast that's why apps. I keep this guy around. <laughs> <laughs> there is another episode to come in Snake Month. Uh, and then the episode after that is Plants. Yeah. Yeah, 145, which means Allie's coming back. So Woo! that's pretty exciting. As usual, everybody, let us know if there's topics you want us to talk about. Our request list is very, very long, but we are always constantly receiving more requests. So if there are uh, Allie's episodes are coming up, so tell us what plant requests you want. We've got tons more episodes, of course, coming up. So tell us what else you want us to do and what you want to hear. We love hearing from our audience. Thanks again for listening. We'll sign off now because this outro is really dragging <laughs> on. <sighs> Goodbye, everybody. Right, just cut the just start the music right. before that and it'll, yep. it'll over. <laughs> just cut cut the recording before. Before that pun. <laughs> trail off into the... <sighs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time. <laughs>